We bring greetings from our Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ. We bring greetings to you from the students at the Ground Trail School of Preaching. We're thankful that each of us still remains on time's side of life, and we know that only through God do we have this blessing. I must admit that I am but a student. I've not yet served out my time. I've only been in this internship ministry long enough to know that that same Jesus who gave sight to blind Bartimaeus will give us all spiritual vision today. And that same Jesus who opened up a supermarket and fed about 5,000 souls with some fish and bread, will feed our hunger and our thirst for righteousness. And that same Jesus who led 12 disciples throughout the hills and fields of Palestine will lead each one of us on home to glory if we would but follow him. Our topic has been announced as God, our teacher and our guide. We as human beings are inclined to try and live our lives our own way each day. We are preoccupied with our perceptions and our own viewpoints. We occasionally seek the advice of human authorities and experts someone to aid us as we struggle to survive the onslaughts of life. But my loved ones, we simply must realize that the one who made us is the only authentic source of aid. If only we would learn to listen exclusively to our creator in all that we do. If only we would allow him to teach us and to guide us through this life, that we might be happy here and in the hereafter. The Messianic prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 48 and the verses 17, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. God, our teacher, and our guide. I would like to define my topic before we get into the lesson. When I speak of God, I'm speaking of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When I speak of a teacher, I'm speaking of one who instructs by precept, by example, and by experience. When I speak of a guide, I'm speaking of one who leads or directs another in his way, in the course and conduct of his life. So God is our teacher. He's our guide to lead us in the way that we live. You know, God has always been a teacher and a guide for his people. We read in Genesis chapter 1, verse, chapters 1 through, verse, through chapters 21, that he taught Adam and he taught Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. We read in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 15, that he taught Cain and Abel. We read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 through 22, that he taught Noah. We read in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, that he taught Abraham. You see, God was our first teacher. He told Moses and Aaron that he would be with their mouth, and he would teach them the things that they should say and the things that they should do. Exodus chapter 4, verses 12 and 15. The psalmist said, O God, thou hast taught me from my youth. Psalm chapter 71 and the verses 17. He will instruct and teach us in the way that we should go. Psalm 32, verse 8. 
But God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the great teacher. He began his ministry by teaching, Matthew chapter 5 and the verses 2. He taught and he preached, Matthew chapter 11 and the verses 1. He had authority to teach, Mark chapter 1 and the verses 22. He did and he taught, Acts chapter 1 verse 1. Through Jesus' example, we have learned how to be benevolent. Jesus went about doing good, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and so should we. Through his example, we have learned how to be compassionate. Jesus saw the city of Jerusalem, and he wept over that city, Luke chapter 19, verse 41. We have learned how to be faithful, for faithful is he who calls us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. We have learned through his example how to be forgiving. On the cross, he said to those who crucified him, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Through the example of Jesus, we have learned how to be humble. He was among his apostles as one who served. Luke chapter 22, verse 27. Through the example of Jesus, we have learned how to be loving. Having loved his own, he loved them to the very end. John chapter 13, verse 1. Through the example of Jesus, we have learned how to be self-denying. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and the verse is 9. But God, the Holy Spirit, is also a teacher. He taught the apostles what they ought to say. Luke chapter 12, verse 12. He taught them all things. John chapter 14, and the verse is 26. Yes, my loved ones, our all-knowing God is a teacher, but he is also a guide. The psalmist said, he leadeth me by the still waters. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Psalm 23, verse 2 and 3. God will guide the meek in judgment and teach them his way. Psalm 25, verse 5 and verse 9. He will lead us in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verse 24. He will guide us even unto death. Psalm 48, verse 14. Moses said that God in his mercy had led forth the Israelites and guided them by his strength. Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. And then the psalmist added on to that, that God had his people go forth like a sheep, and he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalm 78, verse 52. He led them on safely so that they feared not. Verse 53. My loved ones, for the next few moments, I would like to look with you at a great example of God's guidance of his people. And hopefully from the context, we'll be able to draw a few lessons to help us better understand how God guides us in our lives. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9. We'll begin reading together with verse 15. Numbers 9, 15. The Bible says, And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening there upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of the Lord, they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle, many days, 
Then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was. When the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents. And according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. Verse 21. And so it was when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed. Whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Or whether it were two days, a month, a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in their tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord at the hand of Moses. We've read Numbers chapter 9, verse 15 through 23. I want you to listen closely as we try and make application to this, to our lives. The children of Israel were in the wilderness, and they were surrounded now by miracle. But they had nothing that we do not possess in a better way. They had some things, as a matter of fact, in an inferior form. Their substance came from manna. Ours comes by the blessings of our daily work, which is far better. Their guidance came by this supernatural pillar. Ours comes by the reality of which that pillar was nothing but a picture. And so instead of fancying that men thus led were in advance of us, we should learn that these, these supernatural manifestations, these visible and touchable manifestations of God's presence and guidance were just beggarly elements. God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Hebrews chapter 11 and the verse is 40. Now with this explanation of the relationship between the miracle and the symbol of the old and the reality and the standing miracle of the new covenants, let us look at the eternal truths which are set before us in a transitory form in this cloud by day, fiery pillar by night. First of all, let's note the guidance of this pillar. When it lifts, the Bible says that the camp marches. When it glides down, it lies motionless. The march is stopped and the tents are pitched. The main thing which is dwelt upon in this description of the God-guided pilgrimage of these wandering people is the absolute uncertainty in which they were kept. That's the main thing that God is trying to show us in this pillar, the absolute uncertainty in which these Israelites were kept as to the duration of their encampment and as to the time and the circumstances of their march. Sometimes the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle many days and sometimes for a night only. Sometimes it lifted up in the night, whether it was by day, verse 21 says, whether it was by night that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed, or whether it were two days, whether it was a month, whether it was a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. So never from moment to moment did they know when the moving cloud might settle or the resting cloud might soar. Therefore, absolute uncertainty as to the next stage was visibly represented before them by the hovering guide which determined everything and concerning whose movement they knew absolutely nothing. Now listen, in like manner, the same absolute uncertainty which was intended to keep the Israelites in the attitude of constant dependence, though it failed often, is the condition in which we live our lives. 
though we mask it from ourselves many times. That we do not know what lies before us is commonplace. The same long tracks of unvarying continuance in the same place and doing the same duties befall us that befell these men. Years pass and the pillar spreads itself out, a defense above the unmoving sanctuary. And then all of a flash, when we least think about change, it gathers itself together. It's a pillar again. It shoots upward and moves onward. And it is for us to go after it. And so our lives are tossed to and fro, shufflecock between uniform sameness, which may be some mechanical monotony, and agitation by change, which may cause us to lose our hold on the fixed principles and calm faith that we have, unless we recognize that the continuance and the change are alike, and they are both the will of the guiding God, whose will is signified by the stationary or the moving pillar. Now this leads me to the next thing I would like to note. And that's the docile following of the guide. In the context, the writer does not seem to be able to get away from the thought that whatever the pillar did, that movement prompt obedient followers. Look with me again now. He says it over and over again in verse 18. As long as the cloud abode, they rested. Verse 19. And when the cloud tarried long, they journeyed not. Verse 20, and when the cloud was a few days on the tabernacle, they abode, and according to the commandment, they journeyed. Verse 21, when the cloud abode until the morning and was taken up, they journeyed. And whether it was two days, whether it was a month, whether it was a year that the cloud tarried, they journeyed not, but abode in their tents. So after he has reiterated this thing a dozen times or more, he finishes by putting it all again in one verse, verse 23, as the last impression which he would leave with us. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in their tents, and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. Obedience was prompt. Whensoever and whatsoever the signal was given, the men were ready. In the night, after they had made up their tents, after they had pitched for a long period, somewhere or another, even in the night, when only the watcher's eyes were open, the pillar lifts, and an instant alarm goes through the camp. The camp is in a bustle. That is what we have set before us, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the type for our lives, that we shall be ready at every indication of God's will as they were. The peace and blessedness of our lives largely depends on our being eager to obey and therefore quick to perceive the slightest sign of motion in the resting or in the moving pillar that regulates our marching or our camping. Now, what am I trying to say here, brethren? What we're trying to say is that God is the one that directs our steps. It's not in man to direct his own steps, Jeremiah says in chapter 10, verse 23. But we must trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding, but acknowledge him in all of our ways and he will direct our path. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Now, we have no fiery pillar or gliding cloud like the Israelites had but we have a more real guide. In the providence of God, God guides us by circumstance, by his Holy Spirit, by his word, and by his son, Jesus Christ. Now, when I speak of providence, I'm not talking about anything that's miraculous. Providence employs no miracles. It is distinct, however, from the normal, natural course of history from the normal course of nature. However, it always works in accord with natural laws. 
Providence is God working in a special, non-miraculous way. Now, I say that God guides us through circumstances. If you remember, in the book of Genesis, we read about a man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph was a young man who was loved by his father. And Joseph had a coat of many colors which his father gave him. And because of this love, his other brothers were jealous. But one day, the circumstance came about that his brothers was out in the field, and the father said, go out and see about your brothers. And Joseph went on out to see about his brothers. And lo and behold, the hatred of his brothers caused Joseph to be sold into slavery. Circumstance led Joseph to be sold into slavery. But God wasn't through with Joseph. For as we continue to read through Genesis 37 through Chapter 345, we find that Joseph was made second in command over all Egypt. And in Genesis chapter 45, verse 5, the Bible says, him speaking to his brothers, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And then in verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve you a prosperity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And then there was Saul, the son of Kish, that we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 9. We find the circumstance that Kish's donkeys had gotten lost. And he said, son, go out and find my donkeys and bring them back home. And he went out with his servant. And he looked, and he looked, and he looked. And he didn't find those donkeys. But the servant said, let's go over here and talk to the man of God. And they went on over and talked to Samuel. And in verse, nine of first, in verse 16 of 1 Samuel chapter 9, we see that Samuel said, Saul, God has sent me to anoint you to be the first king over Israel. Saul and Joseph and many, many more characters throughout the Bible you can see how circumstances has led them in a certain way in their lives. But we said also that in his providence, God leads us by his Holy Spirit. Now, I know since I've been a member of the Lord's Church that we seem to be afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I get the impression that we think the Holy Spirit is dead. But my brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is alive. The Holy Spirit comforts. John chapter 15, verse 26. The Holy Spirit strengthens Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. The Holy Spirit guides Romans chapter 8 in the verses 14. And the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. He intercedes for us and he works all things together for our good. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 28. But not only does God, does God guide by circumstance and through his Holy Spirit, God also guides by his word. The Bible says he will guide us with his counsel. Psalm 73, verse 27. Therefore, his word enlightens our eyes. Psalm 19, and the verses 8. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And 130 says it gives light unto the simple. The Bible guides us in the way of righteousness. As Brother Ramey said this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it guides us into all things that pertain unto light and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1, the verses 3, it guides us even into heaven. Acts chapter 20, and the verse is 32. But God also guides us not only by his word, his spirit, through circumstances, but God guides us by his son. He guides us by the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus calls his sheep by name, and he leads them out. He goes before them, and they follow him because they know his voice. John chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. You see, Jesus is the door. John chapter 10 and the verses 9. Jesus is the way. John chapter 14. And the verse is six. Jesus is the due and living way. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 10 and the verse is 20. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. 
He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 8 and the verses 12. Jesus is the reality which was expressed by the outward pillar of fire and the cloud that led the Israelites through the wilderness. But the pillar that we follow, my beloved family, will never cease to blaze as did that guide that they had in the desert as soon as they went around across muddy Jordan. We who are led by Christ want no other leader. And you know, we ought to let him lead us all the way from earth to glory. Why? Why should we let Jesus lead us? I believe that we should let Jesus lead us because Jesus is a mighty good leader. As I look at his credentials, I am convinced that Jesus is a mighty good leader. You see, Jesus came down from the Father into the bosom of a woman. He put on humanity that we might put on divinity. He became the Son of God that we might become sons of God. He didn't have the wealth of the Rockefellers nor the influence of the Kennedys. Neither did he have the formal education of the universities of his day. In childhood, however, he puzzled the doctors. In infancy, he startled the king. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. This leader healed the multitudes without medicine. He opened up a hypermarket upon a mountain and fed about 5,000 souls. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. The grave could not hold him. He's a mighty good leader, my brothers and sisters. But one day, Jesus laid down his purple robe for a peasant gown. He was rich, but for our sakes, he became poor. But how poor was Jesus? Well, someone says he cruised the Lake of Galilee in a borrowed boat. He rode into Jerusalem on a borrowed ass. He died and was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he hung up there on a borrowed cross. But today, my loved ones, he owns the church. He has all power in heaven and in earth. He is the only way to God. Jesus is our Savior. You know, as I look at some of those people who he has led, I am persuaded that Jesus is a mighty good leader. He led a cursing Peter, a denying Peter, an impetuous Peter into a preaching Peter who opened up the doors on the day of Pentecost. And 10 years later, he opened up those very same doors to the Gentiles household of Cornelius. And let me tell you, brethren, that when he opened those doors to the Gentiles, the walls of separation, the walls of segregation, the walls of racism, the, the walls of Jewish superiority came tumbling down. He led a persecuting Saul, a church-destroying Saul, a bloodthirsty killer of Christians Saul, a clothes holder of the men who stoned Stephen Saul. Yes, he led Saul. Saul came going to the city of Damascus, and the Lord came with a bright light from heaven and blind Saul on that road to Damascus. And he led him into the city of Damascus. And then he led a preacher man on over to old Saul in order to tell Saul what he must do to be saved. Then Jesus led him when he was stoned at Lystra and left half dead outside of the city. He led him when he was a prisoner for Jesus on that ship to Rome. And when that ship was wrecked, Jesus led him out of the drowning waters onto dry ground. And I'm a living witness, my loved ones, that Jesus is a mighty good leader. About 14 years ago, one Sunday morning, I walked down the aisle to meet my leader. I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I was baptized for the remission of my sins. I met Jesus that day. He lifted me out of midnight darkness and translated me into his marvelous light. He loosed me from my sins. He added me to his blessed church. He filled me with his Holy Spirit. He led me out of the divorce courts with my wife back 
into my home. Jesus is a mighty Godita. He led me here to Brown Trail School of Preaching. He led me here to this 14th annual lectureship to say something to you. He wants me to tell you that he's a mighty good leader. If you are a sinner man out here today, I want to tell you that Jesus is a mighty good leader, that he loves you, that he died for you, and that one day he's going to come back for you if you will just allow him to be your leader. Now let me close with this very convincing quote by Brother Bob Moorhead. As it appeared in Pulpit Helps, October 1983. And may this be our attitude as we launch out to follow our teacher and our guide. And as we try to become all that the Father wants us to be, a reflection of his image. I quote, I am a part of the following of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, chinchy giving, dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, lean by faith, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by love. My face is set, my gat is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear, I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stop me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. We love you, and remember, the Bible is right.